Welcome to Greg's Maker Corner. This is my final video on the Taz uh, 289 Sidekick, and I'm going to be covering just some pros and cons and comparisons and my general impressions of this printer. So I hope you uh, like this. I am going to get into a lot of detail and some uh, technical information, but hopefully uh, that's of interest to you. Um, and if, if you do like the video, please like and subscribe. Okay, um, as I go into this uh, review and general impressions, I've been using this printer now for about almost a week, so I do have enough information now after printing on it, changing tool heads, and trying different filaments and whatnot, um, trying to fill the bed up. So I've got some good first impressions, and I've also got some thoughts on how this compares to popular options like the Prusa Mark III. I do have a Prusa Mini, and I've had it almost since they've been available. Um, for, I've been printing with it for over a year and a half now, and uh, one thing I will say is that Sidekick really is not a competitor to the Prusa Mini, and that, that's mainly because of price. Um, certainly, bed sizes are similar, actually, on the Sidekick 289. It's uh, about a cubic centimeter smaller. If you look at the Prusa Mini, it's a very simple design. It's a cantilever-style uh, gantry. It's, it's a Bowden Drive extruder. They're just two different classes of printer. Fortunately, I no longer have a Prusa Mark III, but I did have one of those uh, several years ago. I, I do have experience with those, so I will be talking a little bit about how they compare. First thing I want to talk about are some of the features that set this printer apart. Probably the biggest thing is that you're in the uh, lull spot ecosystem when it comes to the tool head. You've got this nice uh, 285 tool head that allows you to print 2.85 millimeter filament. These are very easy to change. It's simply, you know, go in, loosen three screws, um, put three screws in, and then change some settings in the firmware, basically through the LCD and just select the tool head that you're using. So I would say that's probably the biggest advantage of this printer. Um, the other thing that I like, although I don't necessarily know it's a huge advantage, is the belted Z. You don't have to really worry about lead screw artifacts, which is a very good thing to not have to worry about. Um, I know a lot of times people will see banding in their prints from a lead screw. One thing that you might have to worry about though is if you do happen to lose power, um, I'm not really sure how well this gantry is going to hold up. Right now it's held up pretty well because it has the, the magnets at the top, but I have not really tested it. Um, something I'd like to do is uh, kind of a, a power off situation. And another feature that's really touted by the company is that you can easily fold this up and transport it. I think that's a nice feature, but for my situation, I'm not really going to be transporting things very often. So that, that's not really a, a big deal to me. But it is nice. If you do plan on moving your printer around or you want the portability, um, I, I think that's definitely a good thing, especially for the smaller 289 version. Going back to the tool head again, I really like that I can add on a Mosquito Bontech tool head. Now it is a little pricey. If you buy the printer, I want to say it's $325, so you get a $50 off, otherwise it's $375. Now the reality of that is you could buy this pretty much the same tool head for the Prusa Mark III um, with everything you need for $263. So it's, it's, there's definitely a premium and all you're really getting for that extra money is the tool head compatibility, which is a printed part essentially. Something that I did put together was a simple spreadsheet that compared a lot of the features and things that I thought were important um, on this printer as well as the 747 with the Prusa Mark III. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop that up and talk through that a little bit and just highlight some of the things that I think um, if you're trying to decide between those two printers that you should you should consider. And as I mentioned earlier, I really don't think there's any point comparing this to a Prusa Mini. If that's the printer that you're thinking about, you're in a, you're in a completely different ballpark in terms of budget. And honestly, you just can't beat that value. And here is my quick and dirty comparison for some of the features that I value and are important to me. There may be different features or other features that are important to you, and I encourage you to do your research and check those things out. Pretty much the rest of this video, I'm going to be covering a lot of these high points and talking through them. Something else that I think sets us apart from some of the com competition is really these uh, uh, tension knobs here. So if I want to tension the belts, I don't have to disable my printer in any shape or form, and that goes for the X, the Y, and the dual Z. So that's a very nice uh, feature, and I think there's a lot of benefits to having that. Um, although the reality is, you know, if you're just kind of printing in the same spot, uh, you're not really going to have to worry about belt tension a whole lot. And once you set it, you can kind of forget it. I did have some challenges with my particular mosquito tool head. 
One of the issues is that this tool head sits up about one and a half millimeters higher than the stock uh, M285 tool head, which I showed earlier. Because of that, I had to actually request a new firmware that allowed me to lower my tool head to the bed closer so I could print on it and get a first layer. Now, the, the only downside to doing that is that this BL Touch now, when it's even when it's stowed, it manages to hit this TPU cover. So that is definitely not a good thing. Um, the recommendation that I gave to Lulzbot is to simply, you know, raise, or I'm sorry, lower the, uh, you know, the assembly here a little bit. So it's, um, you know, maybe one and a half millimeters, similar to the other tool head. So that's something that I fully suspect they're going to work out before these uh, really start going prime time. Overall, the motion on this printer is pretty good, especially with how the belts are set up. However, something that I'm not as crazy about are the V-wheels. So I've had V-wheels on Creality printers before, and they're not bad, but one of the things that happens over time is that they wear. So you've got V-wheels uh, on pretty much every axis, you know, the X, the Y, and the Z. Uh, all of those at some point are going to have to be maintained and replaced. On the Prusa Mark III, uh, they're using a bearing system with LMU8 bearings, and along with rods. So here you can see where you know pretty much everything is this rotated uh, 2020 extrusion. What I'd really like to see would be replacing the V wheels with linear rails and carriages. Now I know that's going to be much more expensive, probably add at least a couple hundred dollars to the build, but I I do like you know this setup, and I think that's where the industry is going. So adding something like that that, I, that you find on higher end core XY machines is probably not a bad idea. Now overall, I don't really think this printer has any major fatal flaws, but I will say it's, it's going to be a hard sell over the Mark III Prusa because of the smaller bed size. For another $200 or so, you can get a significantly larger bed that is actually a little bit bigger in terms of overall volume, at least, of the Prusa Mark III. The other thing that I really don't like, and this is, I heard a lot of feedback on this, is in this case is a uh, INC retro board. That is an 8-bit board. For a new printer in 2021, that's probably not fantastic. The companies are starting to go more to the 32-bit boards, like the Duet Wi-Fi's or the Duet Minis might have been a better choice here. Or uh, certainly there's there's a whole crop of low, lower quality 32-bit boards. Um, I don't necessarily think that's going to be a good fit for this printer. Something that I really do like is that there are a significant amount of 3D printed parts, you know, and, and it really does help stiffen up the printer. It also gives it some cool cosmetics, and you can tell this thing is very overbuilt. You could probably knock it over, not that I want to try this, but I'm guessing if this thing got knocked over, it would probably survive a fall. I had a challenge with was this Bowden tube. And really, it's a reverse Bowden tube because it's just feeding, you know, constraining the filament to the direct drive tool head. But something that happened a few times was this tube got trapped underneath the gantry here and it would, the gantry would lower to go to print and then I would, uh, it would kind of stall out the motors. Luckily I would get a, um, you know, a firmware halt on the LCD menu. The easy fix to that was just putting a zip tie here. That's definitely not an ideal fix because now you can't really <laughs> tension your, your belt. So nice benefit is that it's using a, uh, meanwhile, 150 watt power supply. I think that's plenty for what's needed here. Um, especially the, when you look at the size of the motors, when you look at the size of the heated bed, and when you consider this is probably going to use maybe a 30 or 40 watt heater cartridge, that's more than enough headroom for this type of printer. The other nice thing about this power supply is they're, they're actually not that expensive. Compared to a Prusa Mark III, you're going to spend about 100 bucks if you have to replace the power supply, which I actually did on my Prusa Mark III. Okay, now I'd like to just compare some of the different build plates for the printers that I have. So here, of course, you can see the, the, uh, the Sidekick 289 build plate. Here is the Voron 0.1 build plate, which uh, I have a whole build series on my channel. And then here is the Prusa Mini build plate. Or it's a little bit more than one cubic centimeter bigger than uh, the 289 plate. But again, for value, uh, you just can't beat the Prusa Mini. But for overall features, for tool head swapping, uh, this is a great printer. So overall impressions on this printer. Uh, I gotta say, I've had a lot of fun with it in just a week. I look forward to printing on it. Um, I think it's going to be a great printer addition to my kind of makerspace here that you can see. If, you, if you're considering the 289, it's, it's really a hard call. Um, if you're looking for something that has 
a lot of uptime, you like the tool head features, uh, and you don't mind the smaller build volume, then go ahead and pull the trigger. If you're thinking about a Prusa Mark III, and uh, I would encourage you to spend the extra 200, you know, 200, 300 dollars, whatever it ends up being, just to go with the bigger build plate. Who is this ideal for then? I would say people that are already in the little spot ecosystem. Maybe they've got a tool head. You know, you can pick one up for around $800 if you already have a tool head. So it, it gets cheaper if you're already in the ecosystem. If you're not, which I imagine a lot of people watching this video probably aren't, then uh, again, I, I would probably steer you away from the 289 and steer you more towards the 747 if your budget can allow it. But, but either way, uh, if the build size doesn't bother you, then by all means go for this printer. It really has been interesting uh, as I have just kind of tweeted and seen some responses come in about this printer. Um, people are really trying to figure it, figure it out. You know, who is it intended for? What is the target audience? Uh, I think the hobbyists are maybe a little bit myopic in terms of, man, this isn't a hot rod printer. You know, this, this doesn't fit my mental model of what's kind of cutting edge and cool. And, uh, and I, I think that's true, right? This really, I don't think the, the target audience is the hobbyist, certainly not the DIY hobbyist. I mean, you can certainly build something, you know, similar on part of this, probably for a lot cheaper, quite honestly. So this, this printer is really geared towards probably people who want that high uptime, maybe have a, you know, a small printer farm and have small parts to print. I mean, th that seems to be like potentially one uh, target audience for this printer. And again, as I mentioned earlier, people who are already in the Lulzbot ecosystem, you know, may benefit and, and want to pick up a printer like this. It's certainly a lot cheaper than a Taz Workhorse, um, but it still has kind of some of the same support, the company behind it. Uh, and that's actually a really big benefit to going with a Lulzbot is it's a U.S. company. There's phone-based support even. Uh, there's forum support. As far as I know, there's no chat support. But uh, I, I did use the support um, because I had the issue with the tool head here. It's almost instantaneous reply to my email. I've talked with other folks who have owned Lulzbot, and I know that you know, one of the guys that runs our print farm at Codemesh, uh, Brian Kearns, he has, he has called them and they've sat through on, on the phone for hours just giving him support. He's had a really positive experience with that. I think um, if you're going to pay that premium, if you're worried about having the best uptime possible, this printer makes a lot of sense. And I would say for the target hobbyists, uh, for a lot of the budget buyers that are out there, those that, that particular benefit may not just be worth the premium. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the market with this printer. Personally, I really like the Prusas. I also really like these, and I think it's really good to have some competition kind of in that you know higher tier space. Uh, I would encourage you to really think about it. Are these features worth it for you? And then just continue to see you know what happens and what people are saying about this printer. So I know there will be a few other videos uh, coming out pretty soon on this by other folks in the community. So with that, uh, I really appreciate you staying tuned and you know listening to me talk about this printer. And hopefully I've been, hopefully this content has been beneficial for you to make a decision if you're kind of on the fence about it. And otherwise, hopefully it's been helpful for you just to understand what this printer is and who it's intended for. If you like my videos, uh, as always, please like and subscribe. Thanks a lot.